My name is Alexia Hall, and this is Black Med. Today, we're going to tackle an issue that might be a little bit difficult for some of us to talk about in the community. It's Mental Health Awareness Month. We don't want the month of October to pass by without addressing some of the unique issues regarding mental health that affect our community. Here are some interesting statistics that I know you'd like to know. Adult Blacks are 20% more likely to report serious psychological distress than adult Whites. Adult Blacks are more likely to have feelings of sadness, hopelessness, and worthlessness than are adult Whites. And while Blacks are less likely than Whites to die from suicide as teenagers, Black teenagers are more likely to attempt suicide than are White teenagers. African Americans also have different attitudes towards mental health. And this can lead to barriers towards getting help for conditions such as clinical depression. Listen to some of these stats. 63% of African Americans believe that depression is a personal weakness. Only 31% of African Americans believe that depression was an actual health problem. So we decided to visit Dr. Patricia Adams, a licensed family therapist here in San Antonio, Texas. Her practice, Zeitgeist Expressions, serves the San Antonio, Colleen, and Austin areas. So we know from studies that have been conducted that African Americans do go through psychological stress just as anyone else, and we do have depression. Why is it that we're not getting treatment? There's so many answers to that question, so let's start out with the obvious. First of all, people don't think they can afford, a tre- they can afford mental health treatment. And we say in our practice here in San Antonio, as well as Austin and Colleen, so we cover the South Central Texas area, that that's the last thing we want you to do is have to worry about whether or not you can afford treatment. There are ways to pay for it through your insurance. There's a way to pay through it through your company's employee assistance program, which we can talk about that. But there's also ways to utilize practical students and interns, which we have in our practice, so that we can make mental health services available and affordable for those who can pay as little as $25 an hour, up to those who have to pay someone like me who's been practicing for a long time, who could certainly charge a little bit more. And then, of course, the insurances do pay for mental health services. We have sometimes a stigma, you know, in our culturally. About, no. <laughs> really? Yes, about getting mental health sure. care. How can, what, how do you advise someone that's maybe thinking about it, but is nervous about it, or is worried about what other people would say, family members? Sure. Well, we all have that one person in the family. We know who they are. And we have two in ours, as they would say on the Lion King. And many times we just, oh, oh, it'll be, he'll be all right. She'll be all right. And the stigma goes way back. We were taught to be strong and, and fearful. And, you know, we the culture that we were raised in, the culture that our grandparents were raised in and their parents didn't lend itself to saying, oh, I need some help. So where did we go first? We went to the church. And we still do. We go to our pastors. We go to our pastor's wives. We go to the elders. And that's okay. But the Bible is clear. Everybody has a talent. Everybody has a gift. I'm not a pastor. I have a doctorate in theology. I have a doctorate in counseling. But I'm not a pastor. I'm not a preaching pastor. That's not my gift. That's not my talent. So I went to school to be trained as a professional counselor. So we allow each and every of us in the body of Christ to do what it is we are called to do. Then there's room for all of us to be able to support from a spiritual counseling perspective. And so the first place we go is to the church and we say, hold up, Pastor, we love what you do. We love the way you encourage us and you feed us the word, but that's your gift. My gift is being able to look at someone from a mental health perspective and say, here's the path that if we get on together, then we can work that. So the fearfulness, that that weakness that is associated with that stigma of not going to therapy. I'm so sick and tired of hearing that. I really am. And I wish we would just stop it because at this point in time, we do live in a different culture, in a different age. And mental illness and the people who come to us are not all mentally ill. A lot of people come to us as just everyday folks who are struggling with their adolescence. I've got a couple of those. Or sometimes they're struggling in their marriages because we don't communicate effectively. That's not mental illness. Thinking about getting a divorce because we just don't know how to get along, that's not mental illness. 
So to come to a professional like me doesn't necessarily mean because I have marriage issues or I'm having difficulties with my 17-year-old, which I have one of those, or my 8-year-old who's struggling in school because the little boy is bullying him. That's not mental illness. That's coming along inside someone and saying, how can we help you to create some coping skills and some, develop some different strategies so that you can go on back on the road of life and everything can function in the way that you want. That doesn't make someone mentally ill. Okay, so... What are you? Are you an advisor? Are you? Do you dispense advice? Are you a best friend? How should people look I'm at you? I'm in the like, middle. <laughs> you're in the I'm middle. I'm in the middle. I'm the one with the educational background that says, let's see how we can think about that a little bit differently. I ask better questions than the best, than the best friend. The best friend tells you what to do. If I tell you what to do and it doesn't work out, then you're mad at me. So we circle around and we help you come to some great solutions because we're working together. We ask powerful questions, the what, when, where, how, and who's, where your friend might ask, well, why did you do that? Well, I would never ask an eight-year-old, why did you hit your brother? I'm going to ask, what were you thinking when you hit your brother? I want to kind of change the subject a little sure. bit. What treatments are available for those of us who suffer with anxiety? We see anxiety all over the world. People are not having good coping skills, it seems like. Parents killing their children or abusing their children, kids fighting in school, you know, is is our society becoming more ten, you know, a tendency towards anxiety? And, and what can we do to develop those coping skills and what treatments are there for that? Well, in the state of Texas, there's getting ready to be a whole bunch of more anxiety because we're going to the, what is it called? The, the, the wearing your guns on your, your, what is it called? I can't even think of the Open term. carry. Open carry. I'm Open watching this and I'm going, we're going back to the cowboy, cowboy days, you know? Um, so that's going to create some anxiety, you know? Maybe on some sense it could be a good anxiety in the sense that people won't be so quick to get angry with someone or overreact in a situation because someone could be carrying a gun. We don't know. But I guarantee you our anxiety is going to go up because of we're going to this open carrier thing. As far as the treatment of anxiety, it's just as anything else. You have to sit down and figure out what caused the anxiety in the first place and what are the triggers that cause the anxiety attacks. And then once we can identify those, then we can put some parameters in place so you see it coming before it just grabs you. And we teach people a very simple process on some level called the half a second rule. First of all, again, identify where the anxiety came from then be able to recognize the triggers that could create the anxiety. And then within a half a second, we can teach you how to stop the anxiety attack from being as severe as it was the time before and the time before. And then as you go on in that, you recognize it sooner, so you stop the process. But anxiety is a thought-provoking disorder. What are you thinking about? You are afraid about something. And 99.9% .9 of the time, what you fear does not happen. But there are some folks who physiologically, biochemically, will have to take that anxiety pill. There are some that have to take it, just like any other disease process. If you have high blood pressure, take your high blood pressure medication, okay? That's the same thing we would say about anxiety medication. That is great insights. Um, is there anything else that you would want the African-American community to know about what you offer and, and, and what mental health wellness is all about. Yeah, I, I, that term, mental health, most people, if you look at a bell-shaped curve, the average person, the average individual sits inside the middle of that bell-shaped curve. So the average person who comes to see us does not have a mental disorder. You have the extremes on the bell-shaped curve, which is 2% to the right and 2% to the left. That's truly mental illness, where you have that biochemical imbalance inside of your body, just as you know many African Americans do with high blood pressure. Those are the extreme that people try to make represent the entire bell-shaped curve. That is not what we treat at our practice is really the inside of the bell-shaped curve. The average everyday person, again, suffering with grief and loss, suffering from the, even the loss of a job, the loss of a dream, the loss of a parent, maybe the loss of a child, maybe struggling in school, those kinds of things. We don't really treat in our practice the extremes. Now we can, but they go to different places. So in our practice, man, use your EAP, first of all, it's free. They give you five to six, maybe 12 sessions. 
Um, use your insurance. The co-pays are typically anywhere from $20 to $40 an hour. Again, we have practical students. We have interns in our practice who are seek, who are under good supervision so that they can charge less for those who may not have insurance. We've done everything that we can and will continue to do to decrease the stigma of our culture seeking the help that they need. I never wanted to say on camera that I went to therapy, but hey, if that helps you to go because I went and I'm still going when I need to go, then come on. It's like, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kick the dog. Well, why kick the dog? If I like my dog. Go get some help. It's just that simple. Pick up the phone and call somebody today. That's how easy it is. Okay, you heard her. Dr. Patricia Adams sent telling us not to kick the dog. Don't kick the dog. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation that I had with Dr. Patricia Adams. Remember, we want to empower you, our community, to have all the tools and resources that you need to have better health. I'm Alexia Hall, and this is Black Med.